Greetings and good afternoon, everyone on this call and anyone else who happens to be listening. My name is Brian Spears and I'm the president of the uh, Commonwealth Lawyers Association. And today, in conjunction with the Bar Council of England and Wales, we are having a discussion with the experience of the impact of COVID-19 on the administration of justice across the Commonwealth. And this is our chance to tune in and learn from and share experiences with our Africa Hub. Let me say thank you to our Vice President, Linda Kasonde, who has very much been helpful in pulling this together. And let me introduce uh, Derek Sweeting QC of the Bar Council of England and Wales. Say hello, won't you, Derek? Hello, thank you very much for that introduction, Brian. We also have Christian Viskersen of the Bar Council of England and Wales, who is going to wave at us now. And Stephanie Brown, an admin. So without further ado, making a few introductory remarks, it is remarkable that COVID-19 has affected all of the globe, not just little parts of the world that we hear about and are glad we are not enduring, but it has affected us all all humanity quickly, comprehensively, and our discussion today is to consider how it affects the uh, legal system across the Commonwealth. Uh, in my own jurisdiction of Northern Ireland, we have had law society meetings, bar council meetings, meetings with the Chief Justice, uh, who has prioritized court business. We have had to meet with the uh, Minister of the Economy to say, how much normal business is affected by simple things like land registration and companies' office inquiries. And we are going to split our discussion into the impact on contentious business and the impact on non-contentious business. And Derek, you have kindly agreed to lead our discussion on the impact of contentious business. Would you take over the helm, please? Thank you, Brian. Yes, in the situation in which we find ourselves, I think we can all agree that maintaining access to justice is both vital as well as problematic. Some of the problems which the present pandemic has thrown up are, of course, completely novel. And that means that we have to find novel ways of making sure that access to the courts by members of the public can continue. I think the first and most striking thing is that we are having this meeting over a, a, a medium which allows us from different parts of the world to speak to each other. And of course, that tells us something, doesn't it, about our present position, because it's almost inconceivable that we could have been doing this 20 years ago, or indeed that there would have been options like this for the courts. So technology means that we have a different context now, and some of the things which we can do, we are able to do for the first time within the justice system, within the, um, the ambit really of what technology can offer. But of course that brings with it a, a different challenge. And we have now had something like a month of experience of trying to work with technology in the justice system. And we are beginning to see both what the promise is of technology as a way of delivering justice and also what the limits are. I think the paradigm example really is jury trials. Now we were quite slow in the UK, I think for understandable reasons, to stop jury trials because they are almost a litmus test, aren't they, of whether the justice system is working. And the problems of getting jury trials back up and running again are in one sense almost intractable because whilst it's impossible to get people together, it's very difficult to expect juries to assemble in order to perform their traditional function. So that's very much at the forefront of the thinking at the moment, both of the Bar Council, the Specialist Bar Associations, the Judiciary and the Government, as to how on earth we get jury trials up and running again. Other forms of trials are more amenable to the use of remote hearing, and the Family Division has been pressing ahead with hearing urgent applications through technology and so on. But we've recently had a judgment from the most senior judge in that division explaining that some sorts of hearings in that context are simply 
not really applicable for the use of video technology. So we are beginning to push up against the boundaries of what can be done. And of course, if that's right, what we need to be doing now is thinking about how we can have court hearings which incorporate social distancing. Can we have jurors sitting two meters apart? Can we have jurors in one room, defendants and witnesses in another, all linked by video technology and so on? We're just beginning to work out these things. At the same time, we've had to consider urgent rule changes in order to facilitate remote working and the use of e-bundles and so on. And beyond that, we've had to think carefully about the position of the profession, because if court work suddenly ceases on the contentious side of the profession, both for bar barristers and solicitors in this jurisdiction, that is bound to lead to a gap in incomes in professions which are predominantly self-employed, and that in itself is a threat to access to justice, because if structural damage is done to the professions, then the prospect of being able to pick up quickly when we come out of this is likely to be affected, and we hope not irreparably damaged. But that's another issue that we're spending a lot of time dealing with, support to the bar, support to the professions, either by ourselves within the profession, or by government itself. And I think some of you will know that the government has got various schemes to support lots of different sectors. And the legal sector presents different challenges because of the way that we are organized. So enough from me, that's a, just a pen picture really of some of the problems that we have encountered and are grappling with in the UK. And I thought I might ask Linda if she could give us an idea of what the position is like in Zambia and whether any of the problems that I've just uh, highlighted in summary uh, chime with the experience in your jurisdiction. Um, thank you, Derek. Uh, in Zambia, basically all what they, what they consider to be non-urgent matters have been suspended. Um, and the only cases that are being heard that aren't urgent are criminal matters. Uh, they've been given priority, obviously, because people are in custody, etc. Um, we haven't yet started using technology to try and um, uh, have our cases heard. Although we do have, um, the courts have said that we, we, we can use video conferencing, but we have yet to put into place the rules regarding how that will be done. And also we, have, um, we haven't yet operationalized uh, our rules on um, e-filing of documents. So essentially most cases have been suspended. Um, the Bar Association, the Law Association of Zambia has uh, had meetings with the Chief Justice and given proposals as to what could be done. Uh, and in fact, they invited suggestions from the members of the, of the association. And two of the suggestions I gave were for them to operationalize the video conferencing and e-filing so that at least, um, to at least prioritize commercial and also family matters, um, you know, in times of lockdown, uh, those become critical as well. So that's essentially what's happening in Zambia. And I think uh, we don't have jury trials here in Zambia. So um, cases are adjudicated by magistrates or judges um, so we don't have that issue in terms of social distancing um, because we don't have juries. But, um, for example, media are not allowed to report on um, cases that are ongoing, which I think can be a bit of a problem because then you don't hear about um, important cases that are being handled in, in particularly in the criminal courts. So um, the sooner we find ways of, of getting around these issues, the better. Yes, I mean, that you make a very important point, Linda, that as well as access to justice, one of the things which is most problematic, given the challenges we face, is open justice. Of course, that is a principle which underpins the justice system here and, and worldwide in Commonwealth countries and more widely still. And maintaining access to the courts by those who are not directly participants, the parties, is of course a challenge and indeed it was always going to be a challenge if we had any form of remote hearing. One of the ways in which it's being done here with the government's cloud video platform 
is to allow third parties, journalists in particular, to have their own form of access. So it is being thought about, but it's particularly particularly problematic, I think, if we're using technology. Um, as you say, you don't have the problem with juries. It is, of course, the case here that magistrates do a lot of criminal work uh, without juries, and they are still working, particularly the district judges, the professional magistrates, as it were. Maria, what's the position in your jurisdiction in Kenya? Thank you. Thank you, Derek. So in Kenya, the first thing we had to deal with was the curfew that was implemented by the government, um, where you had members of the public having to be in their homes by seven o'clock. So that meant that only the gazetted essential service provider, um, such as truck drivers, food deliveries, and so on, were the only ones allowed to move beyond the curfew. And that presented a problem for lawyers or advocates, if you will especially when it came to advocates accessing their clients and um, you know the arrests of people at night. So um, we went to court uh, as a law society. The, um, the law society went to court and um, we were then gazetted as essential services providers. This, this just happened about a week ago. Um, the other issue we have had to deal with is that the courts um, initially through the National Council of Administration of Justice, um, downscaled operations to similarly to Zambia, uh, similar to what is happening in Zambia, and we were only having the criminal cases proceeding, but we also had um, the Chief Justice issue a directive that all judges and magistrates had this time to deliver um, pending rulings and judgments. So that's what's been happening. Of course, this was not uh, acceptable to most of the advocates and the Law Society pushed for the upscaling of, uh, um, of the court operations, um, maintaining the social distance. And uh, previously what had happened when the downscaling happened was that court uh, hearings were, hap were happening in the court premises, but outside. So the judicial officers were seated outside and they were wearing their gloves and um, you know, were maintaining social distance. So this has continued to happen. There's been some back and forth between the Law Society of Kenya and the judiciary on um, operationalizing the courts. Um, the judiciary is insisting that we're adopting technology. Um, what, we have, what we have currently is a situation where the judiciary itself is not fully um, technologically supported, uh, especially across the country. You have some divisions like the commercial division and, and part of the civil division. And now you have the, the Court of Appeal actually adopting Skype um, to deliver judgments and to conduct uh, some, some urgent hearings. So most of the courts that have, have undertaken um, technology, uh, you'll find, especially the magistrate's court, it's, it's an effort by the heads of the stations. So it's not very coordinated from the judiciary approach. However, um, now, that, now that the CJ the, has been very, very particular about upscaling on technology, we're looking forward to a situation where the government will then pump resources into this. Um, the challenge we have also from the court user's side is that many of the lawyers haven't actually taken up technology. So we're, we're having a situation where the lawyers are quickly having to learn um, about digitizing their offices, and uh, you know, getting registered on the judiciary portal, the chief justice chief justice has published uh, practice directions um, with regards to e-filing and um, electronic exchange of documents, uh, complete the whole way. And um, so, as far as the court um, court users are concerned, we are going to see a progression upwards um, in the coming few weeks. So we hope. Uh, that this is something that will be adopted permanently by the judiciary. Well, Maria, that's a, that's a very interesting and succinct um, summary of, of quite a lot of material there. A few things jumped out at me. One is the classification of lawyers as essential workers, which has happened here with a certain amount of, of lobbying, in fact, by the Bar Council. Mm -hmm. The other is the whole, the whole question of the rule of law. I noticed that you started with a curfew. And of course, our government, in common with governments around the world, has put in place what in any circumstances outside a pandemic or pandemic or war would be regarded as draconian legislation. 
And I think there is a job for us to do as lawyers about the the extent to which it's going to be necessary to continue with those sorts of restrictions and their legality if the position changes and so on. Certainly the Bar Council here was very involved in submissions about how long restrictions um, should be a feature of the law and the extent to which they should be challenged. So very interesting. And then lastly, the other thing was the technological lag, that there is a sort of wild west at the moment where we're being able to try out things and gradually the courts are coalescing around some common solutions. And I'd be interested to know whether that's the position elsewhere. Do we still have Richard on the, on the call? Yeah, he's here. Hello, everyone. Hi, Richard. Yeah, so like uh, uh, in Kenya and uh, Zambia, what has happened in Rwanda is that um, there's been a downscaling of court activity. Only to criminal matter. So those ones are happening uh, via video conferencing. So the lawyers are able to, their clients are, and then they are linked via video conference to, to a court and the proceedings um, are conducted in that way. The one thing to note here is that Rwanda being largely a civil law jurisdiction, the procedures are such that there's not so much that happens in terms of, of um, examination of witnesses. And so um, judges are having to decide on the basis of written arguments presented uh, ahead of time by the, by the, by the litigants. And with um, a few uh, uh, questioning that goes on in the, in the court proceeding. So I think this makes it a lot easier than what you would expect in uh, a common law jurisdiction where uh, you have to um, conduct a lot of examination of, 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 of witnesses. Having said that though, um, the system already relies heavily on um, on uh, uh, electronic uh, filing. So all filing of matters in our courts is already happening electronically. And so in terms of getting the legal practitioners used to that system of operation, that is uh, already something that we will not have to struggle with. Now, we have about six days left of the lockdown. And I think by the look of things, the lockdown will be lifted after April 30th. And I suspect that what has ha been happening already with, um, with the criminal proceedings is now going to be applied to all matters such that lawyers can um, present their cases you know, in their offices and uh, link to video conference with the judges. Um, no, no directions have been given in that regard, but I, I can reasonably foresee that that's what's going to happen uh, uh, come, you know, first May. Mm. Richard, two, two um, fascinating things then from what you've just told us that struck me. The, the first is the really interesting question of whether a common law oral tradition or the civil law system, which places less emphasis, uh, emphasis on, on oral argument, is better placed to carry on functioning in the sort of emergency that we're facing at the moment. And indeed, many of the problems that I'd referred to when I started are a product of the fact that oral advocacy is at the center of what we do in the common law tradition. So that's a really fascinating um, question, I think. The other question, I think, which you may say so raise, which is enormously interesting, is whether anything 
of what we are seeing at the moment as a necessary response to the pandemic is going to become the new normal and whether some of the things we are doing now are going to be things that we will simply carry on doing either because we have to or because they're a useful way of doing things once the lockdowns end and we get past the the impact of, of COVID-19 and whether we retain some of the features of what we're, we're planning to do at the minute. Now in view of the time, can I just ask if anyone else would like to come in and add something to any of the points that we've had from the various contributors we've heard so far? I wanted yes. to come in with Uganda's uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so in Uganda's situation, it's very similar to what's happening in Zambia. And like the Kenyans, we actually had a draft petition, but uh, I think the Bar Association was very split on whether this is the time to go that way or not. And um, and one of the things that I was wondering, one of the things I wanted to highlight is that we've not yet petitioned. We've uh, met the Chief Justice severally over this issue because lawyers are not considered essential services. We also have a curfew going on. Uh, we have a ban on. Um, Motor, motor vehicle movements uh, to town. So accessibility of the courts has been impossible and yet courts are considered essential services. So you find that uh, um, courts are actually active, uh, especially the criminal, again, they've reduced the level of activity in the courts. It's on the criminal aspect that, 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 that things are happening. And uh, already at the High Court, we had uh, video conferencing and we had already activated our, our regulations for that. But uh, not a lot has happened, except maybe some positive outcomes uh, on access to justice. We've had some, we, we've had the government now considering re, uh, releasing some prisoners that have been on remand for a long time and are almost due, uh, due to finish their remand period. We also have uh, courts relaxing um, their responses to bail applications because they want to reduce uh, congestion within the prisons. We've also had uh, the police stations respecting the 24 hour rule, uh, which is rare. Uh, however, we've had a, a surge of crime, especially domestic violence. So we have a lot of those cases happening and that has resulted in, again in a lot of incarceration. And as the Uganda Law Society, we have a legal aid project and we've been heavily um, inconvenienced in trying to get access to justice for these people. So in light of that, we are having a meeting on Monday to see whether they can consider us essential services or give special passes to legal aid service providers or human rights defenders so that uh, people are still represented, at, again, at a criminal perspective. Our lockdown ends on 5th May, and we're hoping that uh, that will be the last one. But as I told you, we had uh, some new infections yesterday, and that might change things for us. On the issue of how ready we are, it was interesting that Rwanda is, is, is is very ready. We've been receiving judgments by um, rules, sorry, rulings by email, the judgments by email, and also some video conferencing that is happening. Uh, we've also had the judiciary encouraged to complete the judgments that had not yet uh, been given. Uh, we have the media very involved in helping disseminate this information. So I think in our case, we have open justice. Um, and we've had a lot of uh, webinars and such highlighting the, the cases that are happening, the criminal cases, the, the increasing um, domestic violence issues. So we have various uh, service providers getting together to work out solutions. 
uh, in the JLO sector, we've had the police coming out with toll-free lines. We have the legal aid service providers providing toll-free lines so that people can reach out for help. We are also trying to increase on our community policing to ensure that even where authorities cannot reach, people are looking out for each other. Um, that's just a brief on Uganda. Well, Fiona, that's a um, very interesting summary. A lot of the themes that you've spoken about there, of course, are, are common. And the need for lawyers to be considered to be essential workers, I wish you luck with that because it's a very important part of the overall complex of access to justice. But two things in particular, which came out for the first time, I think. One is the effect on prisons, which we've certainly found as well and changes, necessary changes in the view of the courts towards bail and the early release of prisoners or what can be achieved through, through sentencing because obviously prisons themselves may be disastrously affected by COVID-19 infections. And the other thing is the change in the profile of crime. Certainly in this country, I was very interested to hear that, crime generally is down. I mean, for obvious reasons, burglaries have, have fallen away because everyone's at home and so on whereas domestic violence is becoming an increasing, increasing problem. And we've had not just a spike in domestic violence of the sort perhaps we're um, familiar with, but domestic violence which has escalated towards um, fatal incidents as well. So we've had a lot of murders in a domestic context. A lot for us, I should say, I mean, nothing, nothing like in some parts of the world. But, so there has been a, a big upturn. So it's interesting that the social profile of, of crime changes and that in turn means that's a, a challenge for lawyers as well. Brian, I'm just looking at the time. Would it be appropriate at this stage to go to the non-contentious side of um, the business of the courts and lawyers work generally? Yes, I think so. Uh, Derek, that was actually a, <clears throat> a very fascinating set of contributions. We have some people on the line who have uh, not yet favoured us with their thinking. Um, so it will be no surprise if I'm going to turn to uh, David and Stacey and uh, Edward. And I see Justin about to join us, so we'll let... Uh, hi, Justin. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, can you tune in a little bit just by listening, Justin, and then we will uh, bring you in at the end of our next discussion. And if you okay. could... Uh, put yourself on mute, or I think I can mute you, that's great. Uh, David, you have been listening carefully, but um, uh, I might be wrong, but it strikes me that uh, there's a lot of legal work done other than in the law courts. There are deals to be done, there's real estate transactions, there's properties, there's uh, inheritance uh, issues. Uh, in the transactional world, has that been impacted much in your experience in your part of South Africa? Thank you, Brian. Yes, you know, we, we're talking now about non-contentious, but for us practicing in the field of deceased estates and uh, curators and so on, it is really contentious that we cannot do anything because the master's offices are closed, except for specific issues and those issues are the following uh, should you want to bury, bury, bury any deceased person and you want to get funds from the deceased bank account you can ask the master of a high court to allow uh, the release of some funds so that's the one issue. And the second one is with curator functions where you need to pay uh, a patient his maintenance or uh, a minor some maintenance money. You can ask for the release of funds like that. But the reporting of new deceased estates, uh, that is out of a question. Uh, so, you know, that's a bit frustra frustrating in the sense that, you know, that's our living we we earn our our fees from deceased estates and uh, so that part of your practice is is standing still and that is that is really contentious for us but there's no way that i think that it's going to change until the lockdown has been uh maybe lowered to a, 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 a the next level uh which might happen on the first of may 
because our president last night announced that we are moving to level four. We've got five levels uh, of risk. So we're moving to level four. And the question that will be answered, I hope, within the next week is whether our uh, uh, master's offices, where, where the probate matters, as you guys know it, will be then uh, available again. And uh, also the functions of the deeds office, dealing with, with uh, land registrations and so on. At this stage, the deeds offices are closed and it's got a huge impact on the economy and of course, practitioners being part of the economy on their practices because land registrations cannot take place. The one uh, problem that uh, the government is, is uh, uh, having to consider when reopening the deeds offices and the master's offices is that, you know, attorneys work uh, in general is so interconnected to a lot of other uh, institutions like the municipalities that has to uh, issue a clearance certificate for you before your transfer registration uh, documents can be lodged at the deeds office and or where there is a transfer from a deceased estate to heirs you have to lodge a consent from a master of a high court so they're all interrelated and if you open up one you have to open up the other uh, but i trust that they will uh, put in place uh, measures uh, uh, prescribing uh, social distancing and safety measures and allow certain numbers of, of employees of these institutions to work and to deal with specifically the issues that, that, that I've raised. Thank you, uh, uh, David. Those are all very familiar issues to, to me in, in work that I do and in particular uh, where the land registry doesn't work, uh, lenders can't register their security, uh, priorities of interest can't be established. So uh, I really like the point that everything is, is so interconnected. Um, Stacey, you have been uh, patiently standing, I think, but now is your moment to uh, let us know. You would need to come off mute and let us know some reflections on maybe the non-contentious experience in Namibia. Hi, Brian. Yes, thanks. Um, uh, our lockdown ends for May, and we have received, because we are regarded as critical services, um, the legal practitioners in Namibia. So from our law society, we received cards, permits, basically, to allow us to travel or go where we need to, because as our courts face limited access. However, under non contentious site, our deeds office were closed, masters are closed, office of the master, but this week our deeds office opened. Mm. So, for limited hours of course. So that has definitely helped our firms. Um, also our firms, it's, um, you apply to the Ministry of Industrialization and Trade, then you can actually function regarding, um, provided you have safety measures in place. Our firm, for example, we are now authorized to go into work subject to a minimum of 10 per day that may be in the office. So there are some measures that you have to implement, but most of our work we do from home. Um, but now with the deeds office that is opened, <laughs> the firm has some relief, I think. So um, yeah, I think that will all, I, my prediction is our master's office, all those will be regarded as more critical and will be opened after 5 May. But for now, our deeds office are open, we can work. Our court systems, we have had e-justice for a few years. So I think it's functioning okay from our side in Namibia. BIPA, where we register our companies, it's also open. It's also regarded as essential. And then our Minister of Justice has now reached out to the members to just give their thoughts and suggestions on what can be improved and what the government can work on to, to assist the lawyers in 
being operational as much as possible. So that is now due to the minister on Monday. So after that, we will now see what she has set in place or she can set in place for us to function as optimally as possible. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, uh, what Derek was saying about everybody getting used to a new normal, I, I, I think that some court offices and administrative areas which are essential really to the uh, the conduct of business have been found a little bit wanting in their embracing of technology and their willingness to work flexibly and that has created certainly challenges in uh, in Northern Ireland in trying to get our land registry uh, fully operational uh, and I'm pleased that things are steadily improving and technology has uh, got a part to play. Uh, Edward, are you still hearing us and uh, might you contribute about the situation in Harare, if that's where you are, but in Zimbabwe more generally? Thank you, Brian. I listened to the program, and I would have wanted to contribute on the contention initially, because, uh, like in Zambia, we have killed down operations, and unfortunately, we do not have uh, technology. Uh, coming in to, to assist. So there's very little business that is happening. It's bail applications, initial remand, and agent matters. Although lawyers have not been designated as uh, essential services, by virtue of the fact that the courts are being allowed to operate and uh, the lawyers are considered officers of the court, the lawyers have been able to go about their business of representing clients where need arises. So if it has to go to court, and it's one of the cases that have been uh, designated as uh, essential, then you go and represent your client. Uh, now, coming to the non-contentious business, the master's office is totally closed. So there is no business that is going there, and it's becoming a serious inconvenience. The land registry, we call it the deeds office, is also closed. And the membership of the profession has made representations to the Law Society Council to say, can we be declared in essential service and can the lockdown be uplifted? Council has reasoned that the Law Society members cannot operate by themselves. So, Removing the lockdown in respect of members of the profession may not necessarily enable them to do their work. Because if the deeds office is closed, if the, the municipal council is closed, the revenue office is closed, then it means they will not be able to undertake the conveyancing of properties. It means they will not be able to do any of the work that they are supposed to do. It will just be half back. But we realize that one of the reasons why members are pushing is because our economy has been such that members have not been able to save uh, any monies aside. So because there are no savings, members are really hard pressed uh, to, to go back to work and resume earning money. So that is a, a serious problem. Uh, that we are now experiencing for the non contagious issues. There is no electronic or system that has been installed. For a long time, there's been attempts to make the land registry to be automated and to allow for electronic filing, but that has not materialized. So that is a problem. I was able to speak to the chief registrar uh, only yesterday, uh, requesting that uh, they open up and uh, allow for limited business to take place. Uh, her response was that they are constrained in terms of uh, PPE, so they will not be able to open and expose their membership. So one of the things that becomes critical as a prelude to reopening is to ensure that there are sufficient personal protective equipment that is made available by the state. And the her plea was actually to the law society and to the conveyors to say if they are able to donate 
maybe that will expedite the process of their reopening. Uh, without a reopening, they may not be able to, uh, to uh, without that PPE, they will not be able to reopen. She also mentions the problem that the support staff travel by public transport to come to work. And public transport uh, has been severely curtailed to a few government-owned buses which are available on the roads. So that means very few people will be able to travel to work. And uh, if their employees are not able to come to work, even if the senior management is able to come, those who do the running around will still not be there. So the opening of the office will not still achieve the intended end. So this is where we are on the non-contentious business issues. But uh, I continue to receive representations from members who are asking that uh, the, there be some lifting of sorts uh, of the legal work. And I think we will be making representations to the Minister of Justice and his counterpart, the Minister of Health, to see if some of the work can be allowed to take place. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Edward. If we have time, I might ask you just because you are in the role of uh, Secretary General of the Law Society in Zimbabwe. And I mean, one issue is the welfare of our members, uh, the easing of a financial burden through practicing certificates, um, the training of lawyers, which um, some of whom uh, certainly in Belfast are nearing the end of their training, but they need to attend classes and lectures and uh, go through role plays and mock trials and all of that is presently curtailed. So I, I might come back to you just on a, on a regulatory law society perspective, Edward, so keep those thoughts in mind. But Justin, you are there and have arrived late, but you are very welcome. Uh, the situation a little bit more west in Africa, in Ghana. Can you share a few thoughts based upon what you've heard about the lockdown and its implications on the administration of justice? Yes, yeah, so uh, I must say that uh, about three weeks ago, um, there was basically lockdown in Accra and its environs and in Kumasi, these are the two largest uh, cities in Ghana. Um, lawyers were not designated as essential service uh, persons, but um, there was some circular from the president of the Bar Association after having chats with the judicial secretary that uh, in the event Uh, we have lost your sound and you are frozen, Justin, in uh, just as you were hitting your stride there, I think. Um, when your face starts moving again, we'll know the connection has been made. I'm mindful of the time and in these things, it's always important to, to try and keep to time. Um, but if you didn't mind, we probably will have to leave off the very important discussion on the rule of law implications and the assumptions yes, that something something happened yes so they were there to just deal with human rights and matters relating to bail etc so we had but other parts of the country was working we're just encouraged to basically scale down movements and uh, you know enforce social distancing but the lockdown was uh, lifted on Accra and Kumasi on Monday, uh, just this Monday, and then we are trying to get a feel about how to go about our activities. The Chief Justice has just written to the uh, Bar Association, and for that matter, lawyers, to say that um, they are trying to get the cases that come to court spaced out so that previously where you could all go to court and go and sit at nine o'clock and there are 20 or 30 cases fixed before a particular judge and the whole courtroom is packed, it won't happen again. And so they are going to notify lawyers 
you will come in when you have a, 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 a specific time, specific case. You are encouraged not to come with your clients, etc., unless their presence is, uh, uh, you know, needed or cannot be dispensed with. What has happened is that hearings, properly so called, I'm not sure you are going to make any headway in terms of partly heard matters or where they have to take evidence with advocate. Uh, what happened during the lockdown itself was that most of those cases were adjourned to dates at the end of May and some in June. Mm -hmm. um, the, when the lockdown was in place, nothing was happening in Accra. All offices were closed. It was just health workers, uh, parliamentarians, uh, ministers, and the judiciary, of course. But uh, you needed lawyers to go, but nobody was going. Now that the lockdown has been lifted, uh, the registries, um, land registry, companies registry, and other places that lawyers do their business are gradually uh, stepping up. Uh, yesterday, we were informed by the regional security team in Accra that they are going to advise everybody who steps out to wear face masks, and then there should be social distancing. I've just noticed that uh, 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 they use motorbikes as a means of transport in parts of Accra. And uh, there was an order that people should not sit. They shouldn't carry pillion. They shouldn't carry passengers because uh, it was too close. And they have just impounded about 150 of them because they broke the rules. So they are heard in the news we are going to arrange them for court. So, we are gradually getting out, but it won't be the same again. Uh, thank you, Justin. I mean, that reminds me of the motorbikes when I was in uh, Mombasa last August with you, Maria. It wasn't just a, a pillion passenger, it was motorbikes with about 16 people clinging on. So I'm sure we won't see uh, too much of that. Uh, yeah. Look, I think we, we need to maybe draw this together. Uh, we had a late start because of technology. Um, I would be very keen uh, that Linda gives a closing reflection, uh, maybe with a thought about rule of law and the need to support members, uh, Linda. And then I'll turn to Derek for his closing reflections. And then I will wish you all a, a very happy and peaceful and safe weekend. Uh, Linda, do you have any closing reflections for us? Thank you, Brian. I think maybe what um, I can say is that um, this whole pandemic has um, really raised the issue of the divide uh, uh, in, in our countries between the haves and the have-nots. Um, while digital um, technology would be ideal to ensure that justice keeps running, uh, we, you know, there are constraints. People don't have access to these facilities. Um, and uh, some of our courts are not even equipped to, to, to do these things. Um, you know, our president gave an, an address today and um, one of the things he says is it's a really delicate balance between keeping things moving and uh, ensuring people are safe. And I think um, uh, we, we each have to try and find that formula um, somehow, somewhere. And I think that Bar associations in particular are uh, well placed to uh, speak to policy advisors about these things. Um, another thing I would say is that um, we've seen the rule of law being flouted in many countries as they try and um, uh, administer these lockdowns. And um, unfortunately, um, <clears throat> the you know the 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 courts are having challenges at addressing these issues as well. And again, these are issues in which bar associations can come in, offer services uh, together with legal aid um, clinics and things. And of course, on the non-contentious side, um, uh, there is need to ensure that um, those, th that side of things is also kept running. I think what has become quite clear is that lawyers are essential uh, service providers um, not only do they keep people safe in terms of uh, ensuring that they're protected by the law, but they also keep business running. So um, I think um, 
it's it's incumbent on all of us in our own small ways to ensure that um, we you know advise those who are in a position to make these um, adjustments uh, to ensure that all these things are taken into account. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda. Um, just before I turn to you, Derek, uh, Maria, you sort of caught my eye there. Did you watch to, wish to say anything in conclusion briefly? No? Okay. Uh, Edward, uh, you've been very patient. Do you wish to say anything very briefly but finally? You're on mute, Edward. Thank you very much, friend. Uh, just a few issues on the rule of law is that we have also witnessed some excessive force being used uh, by the police in enforcing the lockdown. Uh, but that has been brought under control after a, a court action was brought about by one of the organizations, Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights. But uh, on the other side, we have also noted that uh, the police have not been very active sometimes in enforcing social distancing. And maybe they are so stretched out because of lack of uh, basic commodities. People tend to queue. And as they go into the queues, they press on to each other and uh, the whole concept of social distancing is thrown out of the window. So that has been a real danger for the spread of the COVID-19. Well, then the government has also come up with a, a social safety net by way of providing some bailouts to most disadvantaged families. What we have not been very clear is how transparent has been the system. There is a strong feeling that this system has not been very transparent and that the distribution of the bailouts has been more on partisan lines. But it's something that we are still investigating before we can make a definitive position as a law society. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Edward. I mean, I guess we don't, and um, it's impossible to solve all of these issues in one call like this, but it has certainly raised some very uh, fascinating points of learning and uh, reassuringly shared experience. Um, the cues uh, here are um, certainly hard to manage, uh, as they will be in other places. Uh, Derek, could I invite you to give a, a final brief thought and uh, lead us into our weekend? Yes, thank you, Brian. Well, I think the, the sentiment that struck me was the one that Linda has just expressed, really, which is that we need to be very careful that the pandemic doesn't really accelerate social division. And we have a very important role in that as lawyers, because the people we are called upon to represent are often the most vulnerable, the people who are left behind, who don't have access to technology. And we have to make sure that the enthusiasm for governments to impose lockdowns and find different solutions is curbed when it comes to trampling people's rights. And uh, that's uh, an absolutely essential part of what we do. It's why we should be classed as essential workers. Um, I was also struck by the extent to which we all face really common problems. You might expect that in one sense, although the social settings are often very different in terms of where we're working and the problems that we have. And very interestingly, there are differences, aren't there? Not everybody in every jurisdiction is classed at the moment as an essential worker. I think there is a lot to be said for adding, recruiting to our arguments with our respective governments and ministries, what is going on elsewhere. I mean, the fact that some countries uh, uniformly do describe lawyers as essential workers seems to me to be a very powerful argument if you're lobbying governments to change their position in relation to that so that we have a, a uniform position. And I think that applies to many other things that we're doing as well. The challenges that we face are common and there's obviously a lot of room for exploring common solutions and sharing our experience. And this has been a very valuable opportunity, certainly from, from my point of view as the Vice Chair of the Bar Council of England and Wales, to hear what is going on elsewhere. I've learned a lot from it and I hope that everyone else who's participated will go away with some extra thoughts and potentially things which they can use as well in dealing with the difficulties that we're going to continue to face. So I hope lockdown will finish 
soon for everybody, but that it will be done safely. And that perhaps the next time I meet some or all of you, it will not be over Zoom, as delightful as it is, but in person. So um, I wish you a very good weekend and do stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. That was, Thank uh, you. Uh, thoughts. Well, uh, let, let me wind up then finally to let everybody exit into their uh, Friday evening of, of lockdown. Uh, thank you for participating. Uh, if you have other thoughts, please communicate them by email. I'm sure this need not be the last of these calls. And the Commonwealth Lawyers Association will be having one of these sessions with the Australasia region. You might be interested to know with lawyers from Pakistan and India and Malaysia and Singapore and Hong Kong and Sri Lanka all taking part. Uh, Derek, I'm afraid you and I do this again next week <laughs> with a different audience, but uh, I think it'll be hard to match the ones that we've had this afternoon. Thank you all so much for those of you who I know personally. It really is lovely to see you all. Uh, and I must say the new technology that we've been driven into has many advantages. So uh, look after yourselves and lovely to see you. We'll talk again soon, I'm sure. But I will now end the meeting. Thank you again.